This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. I hope you had a great week, and I hope you're enjoying the uh, podcast that we've been doing so far. We'd love to have you take a few moments, if you would, and sort of subscribe to our channel and ring the bell, of course, as well, so that make sure you're getting all updates of the materials that we uh, publish. I publish about once a week, so uh, there are a couple of weeks I'll take off during the year, but that's, you know, about 50... 48 to 50 times a year we'll be doing a podcast here each one about an hour and so i uh, love to hear your comments you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com of course my website is also wildlife control consultant.com you can get materials there like books you can contact me uh, learn some of the trainings that i offer uh, sometimes pest control operators do hire me for private for, for private training and i can also do consultation writing and photography and other things like that perhaps uh, you can reach out and correspond with me on that point uh, this week uh, we would love to, uh, I'm going to be talking about tularemia so I've been focusing on some of the diseases and so again if you have a subject that you're interested in that I haven't contact that I haven't dealt with of course you know we have several years of materials there's a lot of subjects that I've covered so far uh, you can certainly look over those but if you're having something like hey Stephen I would love to hear about this uh, definitely reach out to me I'd love to get your ideas because otherwise I'm just gonna research what I'm interested in and talk about that so you can get to reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail Com. So let's get started. So the scientific name for tularemia is Francilla tularensis. And so it is a rather devastating bacterial infection. Uh, it is very serious and you may not know a whole lot about it. You may have heard about it as in terms of things like rabbit fever and things of that nature. But in terms of its history here in the United States, it was uh, first probably identified in 1904 in California. There was another outbreak in Arizona in 1907. And then 1908 to 1910, it was had another outbreak in Utah. And so part of this is that when researchers are looking back in time, they're like, yeah, they're looking at some of the symptomology and they're saying, yeah, that was probably tularemia. And it's such a, a varied bacteria and such a diverse one. And it can be rather uh, pernicious in the sense it can really ravage you pretty quickly. There has been concern of it becoming a biological weapon. So uh, be careful how you talk about this particular product. So first identified in 1911 in Tulare County. And of course, if you see the previous presentation, it wasn't officially identified at that time in the 1904, 1907, 1910 Utah, uh, because wasn't known, so someone had to first discover it, so it was first discovered, uh, first identified in uh, Tulare County, which is where the tularemia comes from. And there was an outbreak at that particular time in California ground squirrels, and it resembled the plague. So this is the problem when you're trying to identify diseases by certain symptomology, is that there's a lot of overlap among zoonotic diseases, and so you have to be careful as my, one of my favorite quotes from Johnny Cochran is, we have to be careful of the rush to judgment. So uh, make sure that you're tentative. Uh, certainly we have uh, periods of periods here in, the, in Montana where, where I'm told from producers that they would have a boatload of ground squirrels in one year and the next year they're like gone. And where did they go? And so I talked to one biologist and they thought maybe it was true plague, uh, plague, you know, the black plague. But uh, it possibly could be an example of tularemia. Uh, don't know. So, but certainly something to keep in mind 
that it was covered. So the gentleman who uh, discovered it or I first identified it is Edward Francis, and that's where you get the name of uh, Fran Francilla Tularensis. Well, Tularemia came from Tulare, California, and of course, honoring him for identifying and proving this particular infection caused this stuff. Edward Francis, he was a medical doctor and he died in 1957. So, uh, great guy. We want to certainly acknowledge people that are great his contributors to the uh, humanity's progress. And uh, we're certainly grateful for his efforts in identifying this rather dangerous bacterial infection. So a little bit more of the history on this particular disease. Uh, the Germans during World War II noted that tularemia caused epidemics in Russia, and they found that hundreds of thousands of people were affected. Because remember, you noted, remember, recall that Germany did invade uh, Russia at that time. It was the Soviet Union uh, during the Second World War, and of course. Germans were meticulous, like a lot of good armies, of course, they kept meticulous records. And so uh, medical conditions are important. And so they found that uh, people that were infected with this particular disease had ocular versions of tularemia, glandular versions, and what they called intestinal versions of it. Um, but I, interestingly, although many people were ill, very few people died of this particular infection. And how is it transmitted? Well, they believe it was transmitted by direct contact with mice and roof rats. Uh, they were thinking that possibly there was a water transmission of this particular bacteria, but they could not, uh, they could not prove it. Uh, Germans around the Volga re River region, you'll notice that, remember, Stalingrad, which was a major, major battle. I think it lasted over a year. Uh, it was an absolute bloodbath and it was the turning point in the second world war because the russians were able to overwhelm the germans there and did some major envelopments and uh anyways the germans really took a beating on this and there were a lot of russians that died as well it was certainly uh, a major major in encounter and tularemia of course disease uh, tends to take advantage of war conditions because you don't have the cleanliness you don't have the sanitation you have food supplies that are disturbed you have uh it's dirty and a lot of people were getting tularemia at this time in most cases it caused just fatigue and what they call apathy which is really like fatigue you just don't care because you feel like crap and at that time it was spread by uh, mice and because the grain due to the war was not being harvested so the mice were able to feed on all of this grain and create a lot more of their population during this time. That battle, I think, lasted over a year. Uh, an inhalation of dust, which was contaminated with mouse feces, and of course it contaminated food and water because mice go everywhere. And so that was a major uh, a aspect. Well, enough of the history here, but in terms of tularemia, they have what's called biovars or various strains of this particular infection. And so we actually have what's called tularemia type A and tularemia type B. And interestingly, a type A occurs in North America. However, they did find it in some insects in Europe, but the rest of the world has type B. Type A tularemia is much more virulent, which means it's much more infectious and can lead to death, where the type B tularemia is less likely to cause death, although it can certainly cause some severe illness. You heard me talk about the experience of the Germans uh, in the Second World War as they encountered tularemia in the area of the Soviet Union. Uh, the amount of, inf of material that needs to infect people for type A is only 10 spores. Where with type B strain, you have to be exposed to 10,000 spores in order to become infected. Interestingly, both versions of tularemia can cause significant mortality among wildlife. So uh, that's a rather, but in terms of type B, type B is less dangerous to humans than type A. And of course, the, the kind we have here in North America is type A. So for those in my audience who are in the North American region, uh, you should be paying, pay, paying particular attention uh, to this particular disease. Those of you in the rest of the world uh, certainly learn, but understand that until type A 
moves elsewhere, although again, they found it in insects in Europe, uh, you are at much lower risk of the severe version of tularemia, but you want to just pay attention as well. So the tularemia in general is has these qualities to it. It tends to be highly pathogenic. Again, this is a the type A version. A low amount is needed to cause an infectious dose, and, it, and interestingly, it can be aerosolized. A lot of infections can't be aerosolized. So this is where the dust aspect, you heard early in an earlier slide, we talked about how the deer mice and their droppings were that that caused the dust was contaminated and this is where tularemia can be uh, inhaled in that sense and expose you that way another interesting fact is that it can survive freezing at negative 15 degrees celsius which i would assume is somewhere around zero degrees fahrenheit i think that sounds pretty close and it can survive that even when it's in the, the freezer for three years so a pr pretty robust bacterium here and so it can it's uh, quite sturdy now Tularemia, if you recall what I said earlier, can express itself and infect a variety of different things. And so this is what makes it such a complex uh, infection for uh, those of us in the wildlife control field that can be exposed to it. And even those of you in the pest control field, you need to be paying attention here as well because some of the ways that tularemia can be transmitted can expose you in the pest control field now for those of you who are new to the podcast understand i talk about wildlife control as for those individuals who are involved in vertebrate management uh, which can be anything from mice to raccoons to skunks to squirrels and more where those in the pest control industry although you do handle uh, mice and rats typically the majority of the work is involved in insects and so pest controllers, uh, there's while there's some overlap, there are significant differences between those two fields. And so that's what I mean by pest controllers versus wildlife control operators. So the types of infections that can occur with tularemia are going to be as follows. Now I'm going to sort of read these off and then I'm going to try to go back and explain them a little bit more. Ulceral glandular, glandular, ocular glandular, oral pharyngeal, pneumonia, typhoidal, and sepsis. So what does all that mean? Well, ulceral glandular is where you have a, a sort of a, a wound, typically on your skin, that uh, is where you were bitten, often by the organism that gave you tularemia, like a, like a it could be a, a deer fly, it could be a horse fly, it could be a tick. And the majority of cases of tularemia infections occur this way. A glandular type of infection with tularemia has no skin lesions. And so they're not really quite sure how you got it, but there's no sign on the skin itself. Ocular glandular uh, is relates to the eye, and that is you can actually get infection in the eye. In fact, one of the stories that I looked at was just noted in passing. It said a gentleman who was removing a tick from his skin broke it apart and actually got some of the parts of the tick in his eye and infected his eye with tularemia with the broken with the pieces of the broken tick. So we can contract this in our eyes. Oral pharyngeal is related to our throat area and it often occurs through drinking contaminated water. Pneumonia version of tularemia, of course, occurs primarily through aerosolization of the bacteria. You think about laboratory situations or perhaps you're in high dusty areas where there's a lot of contamination in the soil. There is typhoidal, which is where you have symptoms of tularemia, but there's no known entry point. And then lastly, you have sepsis. Typically, this is a later version of tularemia where your body is trying to fight the infection and it begins to lose and your body begins to break down because of the toxins released by this bacterium that's ravaging your system. And sepsis, of course, I would assume has a pretty high death rate at that point. People can die from this bacterial infection without proper treatment. So it's this is serious. I don't want to say that a lot of people contract tularemia. Uh, we don't know that. It does, it does seem to be rather rare in the United States, but it's not unheard of 
Uh, if memory serves, I think we have somewhere around a thousand cases a year. And again, but those of you in the wildlife control field and the pest control field, clearly you're going to have higher rates of exposure than maybe the general population would have. So it is something to definitely keep in mind. What animals can carry tularemia? Well, the fact of the matter is a lot. And these are a partial list of the number of North American species of wildlife that are susceptible to contracting tularemia. And I'm just going to kind of read down through this. So we have mule deer, white-tailed deer, pronghorn, black bear, coyote, red fox, gray fox, kit fox, bo bobcat, mink, bodger, badger, spotted skunk, striped skunk, weasel, black-footed ferret, raccoon, porcupine, wandering shrew, which is kind of unusual, snowshoe hare or varying hare, black-tailed jackrabbit, white-tailed jackrabbit, cotton-tailed rabbit uh, of the eastern desert brush, pygmy, and mountain varieties. Opossums, beaver, Mice, including Norway rats, meadow voles, voles, uh, California, and Montane. Rats, muskrats, wood rats, pocket mice, chipmunks, various ground squirrels, including prairie dogs, Richardson ground squirrel, Colombian ground squirrel, California ground squirrel, and jumping mice. And so... While that being said, you say, wow, Stephen, that's pretty much everything I almost deal with. Well, uh, that certainly can be rather nerve wracking, but understand but by the same token that those animals as a source of human infection vary tremendously. Some of those species are very common, particularly rabbits. You probably heard of rabbit fever and that's rabbits are a common source of tularemia for humans. And of course, mice would be as well. However, when we're getting to issues like pronghorn even though they can carry tularemia is very it is a very rare source of human infection where animals such as coyote red fox gray fox and kid fox those are occasional sources but yet when we deal with with rabbits and we deal with beaver and we deal with mice including uh, muskrats those are very common sources so not all species that are listed here are equally uh, common in terms of their transmission of tularemia to us and so but you know ultimately that shouldn't matter to you you should be using proper protective equipment whenever you're handling wildlife period and that should just be full stop i always get nervous when i see people grabbing animals with their bare hands uh, i think that especially i've seen people skinning animals with their bare hands and that should never be happening with someone who's a professional how do we get tularemia into our body? Well, there's a variety of ways here too. And so this is what makes tularemia such an impressive infection. We can infect ourselves with tularemia by eating infected wild game, eat, getting contaminated mouth parts or in claws of companion animals, I think pets there, getting bitten by various insects like arthropods. Uh, con I know those of you who are technical, uh, insect is only a six-legged legged critter well I, I get that but for the general com for the general public an insect is anything that doesn't look like doesn't have a spine right but uh, but arthropods is the technical term there right so think ticks along those lines exposure to contaminated water ingestion of contaminated water of course laboratory acquired infections that should be a no-brainer and aerosols of contaminated hay and then contact with infected wildlife. <clears throat> so that's a lot of different ways to be exposed to this particular bacteria. Now, I mentioned earlier the various types of, t of tularemic infections that we can have. And so here is the classic typical infection that accounts for 80 to something like 80 to 85 percent of all tularemic infections are caused are look this way that is there is a classic ulcer ulcerative skin lesion think of it as a part of your skin that's just not healing it's like it's been scraped off or you have some sort of cutaneous alteration that's sort of in the uh, in your skin area just something that's sort of chipped out as well these typically occur at the ex original exposure site like a tick bite or some sort of a fly bite <clears throat> 
Here's an example of a muskrat trapper out of Vermont, and he got an ulcerative lesion on his forehead and, of course, on the back of the fingers of his right hand. So I don't think he was wearing gloves when he was uh, skinning some of his uh, muskrats. So what are some of the symptoms of tularemic infection? Okay, well, you have enlargement of the lymph nodes. You have problem of some forms of infection are very difficult to diagnose. Do not self-diagnose, everyone. Don't diagnose other people unless you have the medical qualifications to do this. It can be very, very difficult to identify tularemic infections. So why are we mentioning this? So Stephen, if I can't self-diagnose, why are you talking about this? Because you need to be informed that your infection could be tularemic because this is serious, particularly for those of us who live in North America. This is particularly serious. So if you have some of the history, you know, you got bit by a tick, you may have gotten bit by a deer fly, you may have gotten bit by a horse fly, um, you may have got, crawled through some contaminated area without sufficient protection, you have this strange sore on your hand, you may have a fever and this sort of thing. Uh, this can be difficult. You need to be kind of keeping some of this in the back of your mind because you may need to remind your doctor that, hey, doc, I may have tularemia. So this is something that you need to be thinking about. There are the two categories of infection. We talked about a lot of different ways you can be infected, but typically ulceroglandular, those are those skin ulcers that you get, and that's 75 to 85%. I think I used a different number earlier. Obviously, some of these numbers may change depending on what piece of literature you're reading. There's going to be inflammation at the exposure site. Typically, that'll occur within three to six days of the original exposure. Your lymph nodes will be more than a centimeter wide, and that's about a half an inch. Pneumonia as a, as a confounding factor with this infection is rather rare. The second type of typhoidal infection, I mean, excuse me, tularemic infection, is what's called typhoidal. And that counts for 15 to 25%. Typically, your infection is through aerosols or ingestion. You either inhale it or you eat it. You get this massive quick fever of 30 to 8, 40 to, 38 to 40 degrees centigrade. So you're going to have a smoking hot fever. You're going to have a headache. You're going to have, you're going to feel weakness. But interestingly, your lymph nodes are going to be less than one centimeter wide. But you may have nausea and vomiting. So you can see how the, the, the symptoms of a tularemic infection can really cover the gamut in a variety of ways. So ticks, I've been beating on ticks. Ticks are a major disease vector for us. And I, you know, my recommendation is kill them all um, and kill more. Uh, ticks are a devastating blow. And so it's two of the ticks that can cause serious problems with tularemia are the, are the American dog tick, of course, and then the male brown dog tick. And you can see the scientific names there, Dermacenter variabilis and Rhyphocephalus sanguinis. So these two, now you may have others, so don't think that they're the only ones, but there can be others as well. Rabbits are a significant source. You may have heard, you know, never, never hunt rabbits until there's been a frost. And part of that's to make sure that the sick rabbits uh, die off. So you reduce the likelihood of your exposure to tularemia. But here are three species that will carry this particular, this particular infection. Beaver, we do a lot of beaver work in our industry, of course. That is another species that's highly susceptible to tularemia. And beaver that die can contaminate the water. So be careful when you're crawling around ponds uh, that you're protecting yourself. And that if someone says, yeah, we had a beaver die, uh, make sure that you're thinking about, you know, do I have cuts in my skin? Am I wearing gloves? Am I trying not to be exposed to this contaminated water? And that can be a source of human infection as well. Muskrats, of course, that is a common one. Some of these aquatic creatures can certainly carry tularemia. And believe it or not, this was a little bit of a surprise to me, and that was voles are believed to maintain the bacteria. So they're, and they are, and tularemia is associated with major die-offs of this, of these particular animals as well. And so some laboratory research suggests that voles shed the bacteria in their urine. So even when you're dealing with something as innocuous as voles, 
then you need to be thinking about are you protecting yourself in terms of your work with voles to make sure you're not being exposed. Yes, even tree squirrels can carry this infection. Here you have an example of a, of a gray squirrel and fox squirrel and fly and a red squirrel. So not flying squirrel, but red squirrel. So those three squirrels can carry it. Typically, you want to be thinking about contact during food preparation. That is, if you're hunting them to eat. Uh, of course, if you're skinning them for whatever reason, and of course, if you get bitten by a squirrel, that can be another avenue of being exposed to tularemic infection. Is there any seasonality to exposure to tularemia? And the answer is actually yes. It typically occurs uh, for many people during the spring and summer months, obviously, because that's when ticks are out, right? But you can also have higher rates of exposure during certain times of the year because of certain hunting seasons and trapping seasons as well. So that can also be a factor or something to help you. Have I been exposed to tularemia? That's certainly another way to look at it. How long does this particular bacteria persist in the environment? In other words, how, how long does someone need to wait? Well, Obviously, that's going to vary in a dramatic way, but here's some data that can help you give you some rules of thumb to think about when this bacteria begins to break down. So in water, the, the bacteria can survive 14 weeks, provided that the water is at a temperature of 7 degrees centigrade. Now it's, you know, probably about 40 degrees. It can last for three months in tap water, and at three weeks, it can survive uh, at 20 to 21 degrees centigrade in the presence of a carcass of a water vole. That's a vole, I believe, out of the UK that was found dead. So clearly, a dead animal in the water can be a source of tularemia, and depending on the temperature, it will tell you whether that bacteria is persisting in that particular environment. Mud samples stored at 7 degrees centigrade, the bacteria lasted for 14 weeks, and it lasted 62 days in mud and 30 days in humid soil. <clears throat> when it came to grain and straw, uh, it can last six months in dry straw litter and 133 days in wheat grain. So that you can see how uh, contaminated materials with tularemia can persist with tularemia for rather long time so the rule of thumb here is treat stuff as if it's dangerous you know because it could be particularly if you've had uh, rodents involved in in that particular grain area or in the soil or it's heavily contaminated and you need to be looking for clues you know when you're crawling underneath a, a porch or a deck or a crawl space you need to be sure that uh, you're protecting yourself from scrapes and cuts because those are other ways that tularemia can get into your body. Oh, one, mother, one further thing. How do you kill it? Well, at the temperature of 56 to 58 degrees centigrade, you can destroy it in 10 minutes, provided that the bacteria has been exposed for 10 minutes at that particular temperature. In direct sunlight, at 29 degrees centigrade, it can be killed after three hours of sun exposure. So how do you protect yourself? The reality is you're not going to be doing swabs in the field. You're not going to be saying, hey, tick, are you, do you have tularemia? Or, hey, squirrel, do you have tularemia? Uh, you should just get into the habit of protecting yourself with proper gloves appropriate to the situation that you could encounter when you're working with wildlife. I think that is just simply common sense. Sometimes it's going to be enough just to have some latex or rubber gloves with you, uh, maybe some vinyl gloves depending on your needs, but other times you're going to need something a little bit more durable, maybe a rubberized cloth doves or maybe a, a good uh, welder's glove, and then of course there are bike gloves as well. You need to be sure you have the appropriate PPE protection because the majority of our exposures are going to come through our skin. I doubt many wildlife control operators are drinking contaminated water or looking to swim in dirty ponds. So this is something, so typically our exposure is going to come from the handling, direct handling and manipulation of wildlife in the field. If you're a trapper and you're skinning animals, clearly that's going to be another way for you to be getting contaminated with tularemia. So you need to be sure you're wearing pro appropriate protective gloves. Hand washing would also be very, very important to reduce some of your risk. Can you disinfect? And the answer is yes. And so I don't have a lot of good information on this. I wasn't sure 
uh, about some of these, some of this information in the sense of how practical some of it may be. Uh, I'm not, I'm a, I, I can't, it's certainly going to be accurate, but the question is, is whether I'm explaining it appropriately in terms of its proper use, because you, you have to remember that when we're using disinfecting agents, there's also a period of time of exposure and how many contaminants are on the site. For example, if you're trying to uh, use hypochlorite, which I think is just regular bleach, a percentage of bleach mixed in water, you have to ask yourself the question, how long does that bleach need to remain in contact with the infectious agent before it gets killed? And sometimes when you're dealing with dirty surfaces, you may say, well, I sprayed it with XYZ that's supposed to be able to kill it. But sometimes bacteria are able to hide in various contaminating pieces. Maybe it's a piece of straw, maybe it's a little groove in the piece of wood. Whatever the case may be, if that, if that disinfecting agent can't get in contact with the bacteria, well, then it's not gonna be disinfected. Another, so bleach, 70% ethanol, glute, gluteral hydide, and formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde's pretty, pretty dangerous stuff, so I'd be careful definitely with that. Moist heat at a temperature of 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes, and then dry heat for a temperature of 320 degrees to 338 degrees for at least an hour. So it's interesting how moist heat is more destructive to back to tularemia than dry heat, which is rather fascinating. Other things that you can do, of course, is flame your traps. A lot of wildlife control operators are certainly doing that. Now, you don't have to flame them till they're glowing red, but certainly wanding them with a good, a good propane blowtorch is, uh, or, or weed burner is certainly uh, something that many more wildlife control operators are doing because it does a variety of things. One, it helps clean the trap and it also helps remove odors from your trap and as long as you're not making the metal go glow it's you're not going to really reduce the the lifespan of your trap for very long of course all of you should have hand sanitizers of at least 60 percent alcohol or more hand washing is always best particularly with you have the friction action of using paper towels try to avoid using your air dryers whenever possible because some of that uh control is when you're using soap you're not really killing the, the disease organisms is that you're washing them away where an alcohol uh, where an alcohol uh, hand sanitizer would actually kill certain bacteria but doesn't kill everything and if you have the choice it's better to wash your hands dry them with a paper towel clean paper towels and then perhaps use uh, hand sanitizers if you want to really take it up a notch but if you have a choice hand washing is obviously going to be better than alcohol sanitizers but a lot of times we're not we don't have the ideal in the field you should have a good bottle of this and make sure there's enough in your palm and really put it over your hands and <clears throat> use enough don't go skimpy on it you need to be sure you have enough contact with that ticks are another major source of tularemia make sure you know how to remove them properly here's uh, one device that's marketed out there i can't speak to whether it is uh effective or not i haven't used it on myself with a tick but certainly it's an option you don't want to be using things like uh, vaseline or or a heated a heated needle you need to be getting a good pair of tweezers thin uh, pointy tweezers and grab the tick bat as close to the skin as possible and then gently put pressure to pull it off so that you're not ripping them apart and this is a product that allows you to sort of lever him off of your skin because you want to get that tick out of your uh, system before he's able to certain diseases i can't speak for tularemia but like lyme disease requires a certain period of time in order for that bacteria to get into your system so if you can get the tick quickly enough you can prevent exposure to at least lyme disease Lastly, you want to be sure that you're keeping good records of your work and you want to keep this card with you. This is the U.S. Department of Agriculture Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service Medical Alert Card. And this is something that you can carry with you and give to your doctor so when you're feeling poorly, 
you need to be reminding your doctor that you work with wildlife and that you can be exposed to a variety of things. Those of you that work with pesticides also need to remind your physician that you work with pesticides as well, although pesticides are mentioned in this particular card as well. Remember, your doctor's not thinking about all of the different organisms that we're exposed to as wildlife control operators. They're under a lot of pressure, so you need to make sure you advocate for yourself to tell your doctor, hey doc, remember I work with wildlife, so if there's you know, when I'm having a fever, don't just assume it's the flu or COVID. It may be something else. It may be a zoonotic, right? So you're not self-diagnosing, but you're giving your doctor a heads up to be thinking a little bit more deeply about some of the tests that he or she may need to run on your condition to make sure you get a proper and speedy diagnosis. Well, that we've covered a lot, and I'm sure you're like, oh, Stephen, you're kind of making me scared about my work, and I didn't find, and I hope a little bit of fear. I, I don't want you to be paranoid, but I think a little bit of fear is appropriate, just to remind ourselves that the kind of work you do is very valuable, it's very important, but it's also dangerous, and so I don't want to overstate the danger, but. You, we are exposed to things in that you do need to be sure that you're being careful to the extent you can be and that you advocate for yourself when you're talking to your physician so that you can have a long and prosperous life in the wildlife control field. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I do hope you take a few moments of time to uh, subscribe to the podcast. I would love to hear your comments about the show if you have a product or idea that you would like to come onto the show, I'd love to interview you. You can reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. And again, this is Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.